Hey, Kelly. Hi, Kevin. Welcome. Thank you. We are uh, here on a fantastic Sunday morning. So, this is it Sunday? It is. I think it's, it is. I think it's Sunday. Yeah. So, <laughs> our fabulous Kevin E. West, straight from the West Coast, doing fabulous things. All the way from the West Coast, yes. All the way. <laughs> well, at least it's, you know, it's not seven time zones away. No. So, no. Which would be like Egypt or something. Uh, Australia? I don't know. Ooh, Australia is, I think, 14 time zones, actually. It's uncomfortable. Or 17. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you for joining us today. My absolute pleasure. Awesome. Um, we are <clears throat> live and we were working out a couple of little bit of some link issues that uh, some other people were experiencing. So we should have all of those all good to go. And so, I tend That's to cause IT issues. It's one of the things that I do. Is, it, is that what you do? You cause well, them? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I cause them just by, you know, breathing. <laughs> well, the, uh, the rate at which you manifest things, if you could shift gears for the duration of this, that would be freaking awesome. Okay, all IT things solved, done. There we go. Solved. Awesome. Well, um, I have loved some of the stuff that you're in, but I would like for you to share a little bit with the audience about how you come to be on this particular event, if you would, please. Uh, I, I imagine that I'm here in some way in terms of, of you being referred to me because I have been speaking uh, for come May, uh, three decades. And some of that speech has been educational. Some of it's been motivational. Some of it's been inspirational. And uh, I'm a corporate person who speaks on communication. So I think that combination of things is probably what brings me to your presence today. <laughs> awesome. And I believe your, your generosity and a sense of humor so that you were able to overlook the fact that everywhere else, I have to tell you how generous this man is, that everywhere else publicly his name came out right, but I've had a serious talking to, to Siri about the spelling of names <laughs> and the way in which he, my Siri is a he, thank you, um, he addresses people. He sometimes has a mind of his own. For, for a bit, I had him calling me sweetheart, but then I realized he was addressing business males as from sweetheart. And I thought, you know, that's probably not going to work. Yeah. So I've had a talking to. Siri's going to have to have an adjustment. <laughs> Siri, Siri did get an adjustment. <laughs> so I am from Texas, so that's still a viable um, greeting where I'm from, but uh, at any rate, um, you have been in the industry of speaking, acting for quite some time. Yes. We won't get into how long either of us have been in our field, but the... Um, oh, no, I'm old. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> As am I, but I thought we would just try not to... In chronological years, but not in spirit years. I'm very young. There we go. And that's what we're bringing in today is how do you stay young in spirit years? Uh, you started doing improv and comedy early in your career? Yes. I, uh, I used to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> On occasion, I still am when I try. Okay. But yes, okay. I, I have a very fast mind. I have a very sharp tongue and, uh, and improv sort of suited me. Yet the irony in that is, is that I basically have spent most of my career in front of the camera doing what we would call drama. So it's a, I'm a walking contradiction in a lot of ways. I call that a brilliant dichotomy. Yes, I like it. Myself. Uh, 
I, I think that most interesting people are a brilliant dichotomy and certainly people I like to surround myself with, which is why I'm super happy that you decided to do this. Was that the easiest introduction into being an actor? Uh, I don't, I mean, I'm a Pisces. So, you know, the part of the dichotomy is, is that I am, I am a sensitive Piscean artist person, but I did not grow up that way. I grew up uh, in a pretty tough part of the country and I grew up uh, with a single parent home, pretty much alone with my sister and I raised ourselves. And so I call myself, you know, a sensitive Pisces who's no BS who played third base. Uh, that's another part of the dichotomy. So uh, I'm, I'm quite certain that my general giving nature and my general sensitivity, my inner sensitivity, uh, certainly helped me as an actor, but I would be really honest with you, Kelly, and say that long before that, the nature of me came out when it had no reason to come out in which I was living in the South. And I, I got interested in psychology when I was 20. And this is in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which back then was, was truly um, a small, small, small town. And so there was really no logical reason for me to have an interest in psychology. So I, I think that the fact that I naturally did, you know, if you want to discuss naturism, nurturism, uh, mm -hmm. I think that that being a Pisces and also finding a, a deep interest in psychology and one's own uh, self introspection had a lot to do with probably what eventually led me to choose uh, the arts and performing uh, when I when I finally gave up my uh, my dream of being a professional athlete. Yes. Okay. In what sport were you aspiring? Well, I, I, if I'd been born bigger, it would have been football, and I played baseball quite well, but it actually was golf. I, I, I transitioned to golf, and I, was a, I made it to the collegiate level, but uh, as I like to say, I was good enough to know how good I wasn't. <laughs> I love that, and uh, when I make it to the West Coast, then I'm going to see if I can outdrive you. Not a chance in Hades, but good luck with that. <laughs> Bring it on! Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about where that that comes in, but I want to address, I want to ask you about, or, or mention that you have played in some of my most favorite shows. I love the murder and mayhem, the fact that somebody dies and it gets solved by the end of the hour. <laughs> A lot of times I die. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've got to be good at something. So, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but those are those are my favorites. I, I work in the psychology field where it takes a really long time to see solution, done, solve, check in the box, move on. And so in my off time, that is where I like to be. It's like, oh, problem solved, right. done. Um, that brain switch, but I think that probably your background in being able to understand the psychology of people probably put you in a perfect place to uh, be able to enroll in the characters and enroll other people in your um, playing of them. I would say my diverse background and just what I chose to do with psychology does help me be, uh, does help me pretend well, yes. Uh, that's always a dangerous statement because you run across people your whole life who believe that every single person who ever trained to be an actor is is an inherent liar, which is uh, <laughs> under, understandable. It's mildly offensive, but um, but certainly uh, my introspection and my my nature has allowed me to be uh, a, a good pretender and have it not be as difficult. But it still requires a lot of work to get to the place where in the environment of actually shooting a television show, which is not normal or comfortable at all, that you still are able to do that. Uh, and then in life, it, it certainly, I'm, I'm probably a fairly natural empath. And sometimes that has its benefits and sometimes that has its downsides. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, a lot of people that had a more challenging upbringing or non-traditional upbringing, have the capacity to adapt and adjust and overcome more so than folks with a little bit less resiliency in their upbringing? Would you find that to be true? A hundred percent. I 
lived in 23 places and I didn't have anybody in my family as a child who was in the military. So when you have to start new schools, when you have to meet new people, when you, I started working when I was 11 years old uh, with the general public. I mean, those are all things that, that force uh, a lot of them, I think are, are really terrific. Some of them, you know, maybe not so much, but I, I do think that we have, because of digital technology, we have found a way even pre COVID uh, to sort of live in echo chambers and silos in a lot of ways. And it's just, um, it's, it's not a particularly healthy way to evolve as a human, in my opinion. Right. Right. I was listening actually to a comedian some years ago that <clears throat> said, you know, those of us, and I can relate, I had my first job at 11 and <clears throat> one of my cousins says we were raised by wolves, which is not true. I'm here to say to all my family that's actually watching, <laughs> but we had free reign and raised ourselves a lot of the time, much like you were saying. And it does give us the capacity to to really refocus and be present to what's going on and read people, if you will, to stay safe. I think that's kind of a safety thing initially. Yeah, that's it's one of the reasons why I'm a speaker on communication, because one of the biggest things you learn if you if you live any kind of a diversified life at all is you learn how to communicate with others, just not the ability to speak the language that you're that you learn. And we live in a world now where nobody wants to have a difficult conversation, but life is filled with difficult conversations. They're not confrontations. And when you don't grow up with a certain degree of, of development to handle uh, difficulties, which life is, then I, I, I find that a very high percentage, and this is not just limited to people who are younger. I, I thought for a long time it was really just, you know, the generations that had grown up with a cell phone, but it isn't. It's actually, it's actually you know, uh, drifted into people's parents, people in my generation. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, not every conversation that's difficult is a confrontation. It's just a difficult conversation. And you, if you don't develop the skills to have and uh, get through difficult conversations, be them with friends, parents, siblings, lovers, uh, co-workers, colleagues, or anyone else, uh, life is going to be a lot harder for you. And, and it's one of the things, no matter what your background is, you, you just have to learn how to communicate. And since, you know, this whole uh, show of yours is, is, you know, be well and, and balance and wellness, um, I, I find that a lot of the unhappiness that I see, Kelly, these days is because people are, you said it just now in terms of behavior and observation and being safe, but it's both safe physically. People don't develop awareness skills and behavior skills and in a certain degree of hypo, you know, hypothetical critical thinking, but people also are scared of just talking to people. Yeah. And it's like, what an, un, what an unwell way to psychologically live your life. And if your mind is constantly subconsciously or consciously scared of everything, uh, that creeps a lot of sickness in, in, in terms of your physical body. And in my opinion, and I'm not a medical doctor, but I see them very, very inextricably tied these days in the last 10 or 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. The amount of high blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart problems, the the rate at which autoimmune has increased is one side of it. And I, my background is substance abuse primarily. And the rate at which certain things have gone up, it, even 10 years ago, it had gone up 500% for mm -hmm. prescription medications. And People aren't talking to each other. They are going to cause their themselves pain. Correct. And so, yeah, there's there's a well-rounded way of being that we can start to release that stuff, I think. And a lot of people talk, but they're not saying anything. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I spent my days, you know, again, not necessarily as isolated as we've been in COVID, but I mean, I live in Los Angeles. So, you know, Kelly, just in the community that I have lived in for a long time, uh, you know, substance abuse, I, I can 
you know, I can walk outside and throw a rock and hit 20 people that are sober. I mean, it's, it's not, it's pretty common in, in, in the area that I live, but if, if I spent time every day being afraid to engage or encounter, those are the two words, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the general public. I mean, where else would you go? You would escape into these days, either actually really bad drugs or what has become the real problem in America, prescription drugs. And so, I mean, if you're afraid or you're challenged by just basic encounters or basic engagement, uh, escapism through substance abuse would be a really common way out. And a lot of times people don't recover from it. And it's horribly sad. Absolutely. Horribly, horribly sad. The <clears throat> ability with which people can share authentically, I am noticing is just smaller and smaller that we are spending, especially with the everybody working from home and being online it's like okay is my hair good everything's good <laughs> and all you can see is this and then everything behind them is a train wreck and it's do you think that it has uh, enabled people to be more or less authentic with how everything has gone to virtual I, I think with the same with human beings, I, I think unfortunately it is, what was your baseline again, in terms of wellness or balance or some of the things that I've you know probably figured that I would mention today in terms of my own evolution. I, I think where everyone's baseline was on 315.20, that's the day that they kind of started to shut the country down because right. I was in South Carolina shooting uh, the Righteous Gemstones for HBO and I landed on Friday the 13th back in LA and two days later they, shut the state down. So whatever your baseline was at that moment in terms of your own evolution, to me is whether or not people have found a way to, to grow in a healthy way and learn about themselves at a time of, uh, you know, extreme concern and, and isolation, or whether or not it has taken, you know, maybe two or three things that you were not particularly, you know, well evolved on and made it worse. I think it, it probably has gone both ways for people. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And we're probably more exposed to uh, the conversation than perhaps some of the general public about being real. And we get to, in all of the time that we spend pretending for a camera or a training or whatever, avoiding our background story is not doesn't serve our population, our audience. Yeah, no, I mean, what COVID did, Kelly, was it, it made everybody, it made everyone, whether you liked it or not, you had to stop the hamster wheel of your life. That. Yep. We go 35, 40 years, kids, marriage, thing, blah, wee, and a hamster wheel. Yep. And, woo, and all of a sudden, <laughs> And when you are forced, and I really just go back to March, April, and May, I just go back to 90 days. 90 days for people is a long time. Whether you believe you can break a habit or start a habit in 13 days or 21, you can pick an article and decide which one of those you prefer. Uh, yes. But, um, but 90, 90 days was a long enough period of time to have people start going bonkers. And part of what that exposes is what part of your mind and your soul and your essence and your being are you able and have been able to avoid for perhaps your whole life longer than you thought because you've been on the hamster wheel mm -hmm. and when the hamster wheel comes to a stop uh sometimes you get stuck trying to get out of the cage and i you know that's that's a lot of what i have witnessed just amongst the people that i have engaged with in the last you know eight to nine to ten months is is how much it forces you when things get still and quiet to go, damn, who am I? There's a lot of that I've seen go on across the country and not just in LA, because like you said, we're all on Zoom and talking to people and I'm from Tennessee and I got friends all over the country and all over the world. And so it's not, it isn't just here, man, <laughs> it's, it's elsewhere. It's, it's everywhere. And I, it, I saw people either on one side or the other. They were either crashing or going, oh, here we go. I think it was the universe is like, I've been telling y'all to slow down. I've been telling you to spend time with your families. I've been telling you to go outside and breathe fresh air. 
without having to have a party to do it. So watch this. Yeah. Oh, my man, watch this. Um, and even though it did, it took me a couple of weeks, like, you mean I have an excuse to just read my book? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 part of me feels bad, Kelly, because I, I've had a long to-do list in my life and I certainly own the company and I, I have, I have run hard on that hamster wheel mm -hmm. uh, and in a, hopefully in a, in a healthier way. But I, there were a lot of things that I just knew I was never going to get time to do. And quite frankly, those 90 days, I felt pretty guilty because I flipping loved it because what it gave me permission to do was it gave me permission again, as an empath and a giver, was it allowed me to remove all of the engagements, the coffees, the meetings, the things you physically would do out. And again, traveling in a city like Los Angeles, which Dallas Fort Worth is, you know, Dallas Fort Worth or wherever it is uh, you are, Austin or anywhere else. But um, I got to basically be with myself for 90 days and I got something done that had been on my list for 10 or 15 years. I never had really done my YouTube channel right. I never had learned how to do all that stuff. And it takes hundreds of hours to do it when you're an old person and you didn't grow up on a YouTube channel. But <laughs> I, I got most of it done. Uh, it's not completely done, but I certainly learned how to do it. And that it was it just brand, it, it just brought such joy to me to get up every day and go. I always do the feet at the floor thing mm -hmm. and just know that I had permission to just go in and work on that. Yeah. And and. And I, again, that's a lot of when, if somebody were, are to ask, or is to ask me about wellness and balance, a lot of what I don't think we take time to do, especially as we arc our lives and we go from our teens to our 20s to our 30s and whatever that entails in your personal life. And I don't think we pay attention to not only our body clock, right. but our weekly rhythm. And those are the two things that I, over the course of my life, I have had to change drastically. And I think when you pay attention to them more about what fits for you, uh, you can live a much healthier, balanced life because we tend to do things out of habit that other people do or habit that I've been doing for 15 years. And it doesn't necessarily mean that from 20 to 35 that you should necessarily be doing that thing on that particular day of the week or that thing during that particular time of the day. And I think that has a lot to do with, with wellness and health your mental and physical body clock and weekly rhythm. Absolutely. Um, definitely. And real early on in your career, you put together a business to help <laughs> actors to, to protect themselves. You want to talk about that a minute? Yes. I, uh, I accidentally started a business. <laughs> I wasn't, I, I, it truly was an accident. I uh, think it was a movie way back called The Accidental Tour. So I was the accidental entrepreneur. Uh, I didn't mean to, but that's the way it went. It started with a simple meeting in my house. But I, I've had a lot of people ask me because the Actors Network was a very, very unique organization. It was one of those things that, that you know, people tell, there was nothing that ever existed like it. And it was one of those things that people told you, oh, dude, that's not going to work. How you, you can't actually get actors who are selfish, self centered, narcissistic to be willing to actually help each other. And I said, I think you're wrong. And I mostly, Kelly, started it again because I'm, I'm a sensitive person. It's funny, Hollywood has never offended me. It's one of the things I put in my book. I get offended by people all the time, but Hollywood is very clear on what Hollywood is. And yes. when, I, when I speak about Hollywood, I'm like, man, if your disposition doesn't fit with trying to actually do art performance for money, in a place like New York or Hollywood or anyone else, then just do it for fun and live your life. But you don't have to be doing this chasing a dollar. Uh, and so what I saw was, Kelly, is I saw a lot of unnecessary pain. That's really what, what drove me to start having meetings, which eventually turned in to 23 and a half years of my life in an award-winning organization and 5,000 people from all over the world. Uh, so that's, that's how that evolved. And it evolved slowly. I wasn't rushing out doing marketing. I wasn't, I wasn't even really trying to do the organization, quote unquote, to make a ton of money, clearly, because, you know, most of my customers are irresponsible, lazy and broke. So not the greatest demographic on the planet. Um, but, but yet the organization did succeed, not only in its, in its thumbprint on Hollywood, but also 
the membership by definition of the percentages of success in Hollywood, my organization had a higher percentage of success per the amount of members that we had. We have some, I mean, if I gave you a list of names of all the people that were members, you'd be like, oh my God, I know that person. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, uh, it, it was, it was certainly a huge part of my life. Uh, I closed it on June 30th, uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. And I am actually seven and a half years later, I'm in the middle of developing an online program uh, because I, at this point, can perhaps bring some of that globally to everybody around the world. Fantastic. So in that transition, you wrote a few books. <laughs> yes, I did. They're behind me. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Oh. It's, All life. Right. it's life in a word. Life in a word. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I did. I uh, I wrote my showbiz book, and then I wrote um, this dictionary uh, idea that I came up with, and I have four more in process. Oh, in process. Oh yeah. Uh, my biggest one is the dating book I wanted to write. See, again, this is what happened during COVID. One of the reasons I closed my company is that I'd always wanted to write a dating book, not a relationship book, not okay. a recovery, not a recovery from a relationship book, right. a dating book, awesome. which, is, which is the foundation of the relationship. It's the foundation that the house of the relationship is built on is the dating period. So that is, that's one of my main focuses as we speak is that book. And then I have, I have, uh, three others that are sort of uh, fun, as it were. Right. Fun books. I love that. I can't wait to read it. Um, somebody was like, well, I'm talking to somebody. What are we in third grade? <laughs> We've lost the art of dating. Uh, yeah, again, it goes back to communication. And to me, it goes back to internal comfortability. Yeah. Comfortability with communication. Right on. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. But, It'll be interesting to see how an entire speak about training people to communicate. What are some of the primary premises of that program or show? Do you mean my speak, my communication speaking? Yes. What are the giveaways or the takeaways from? Oh, takeaways from communicate. Well, I, 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 primarily predicate most of my communication speaking on uh, the, the concept that I trademark called AEI, which is audience, environment, and intent. Uh, those are the three things that, that we don't necessarily stay cognitive of enough when we communicate. Uh, who are you talking to? Where are you? And what are you trying to accomplish? Because as I used to always say, and I do say, and this actually is acting related, uh, I could say the exact same thing to one set of people in one place and get a laugh. And I could say the exact same thing to another set of people in another place and get shot. And the fact that we don't, that we don't learn, we learn our language and we learn how to speak it, but no one ever really teaches us how to communicate. It is something we do learn in life on the fly. And a mm -hmm. lot of it comes from our parents. I was, again, I took child psychology courses. And then a lot of that happens from the environment that we do immediately after we leave home, uh, if you ever leave home. Uh, and so <laughs> audience environment and intent is, is sort of the basis for my organic journey of communication. But to that end, Kelly, uh, I also talk about, uh, you know, we have this phrase selfie that we always take, but I have a thing when I speak called the self -E, F E E. And it's because a great deal of our communication is driven by fear, ego, and envy. And, mm -hmm. and, if you, and if you're not conscious of what fear you may have of an audience member or how your ego is affected by an audience member or you have envy of an audience member, be that a friend, a colleague, or anyone else, then you're probably not going to, you, there's, you're likely not to either communicate what you wanted to, or you simply will not communicate at all. And I'm a big person that silence is not a form of communication. It may be an indicator of a feeling, but it's not a form of communication. So that's some of the basis of what, if I were to consult somebody on communication, whether it was a CEO of a company or whether it was somebody who was a vice president or was someone who just, you know, ran a flower shop and had three employees. Uh, I always come from the, from the place of, of AEI 
uh, when it comes to speaking to them initially about what they feel is is not going well with the flow or the execution of their company or their life. Because I've probably consulted about a thousand people at this point in my life, quite a few. All right. So that's your primary uh, purpose right now or primary focus these days? I mean, yeah, I, I audition for television all the time. I just haven't, uh, we, we went through a period for six or seven months, which Hollywood was pretty shut down. Uh, and so we started auditioning again in eh, late September, October. Uh, mm -hmm. I've read for Queen of the South and Magnum PI and some film, and I haven't booked any of them. Uh, but that's the life of being uh, a longtime veteran uh, television actor. That's life. Uh, but yes, I, I don't, I don't sit around and wait for the phone to ring. I have always been somebody who is very much a self-starter. And so whether it's three or four books or an online program or doing corporate Zoom speaking, I'm, I'm always busy doing something. Not a hamster wheel. No. Just busy doing something that I want to do. Right. And I, I love that. It's some people look at those of us who always have something going on or, wow, did you get bored during COVID? I, I don't get bored. No. <laughs> it's I huge. It's, it's huge. Great. Like, I don't get bored. <clears throat> I got I, three clicks on my computer. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, so this I mean, <laughs> the, but the boredom thing is one of the things that, that I think is the greatest, would be one of the greatest results and 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 side effects of covid is for you to have gotten off of this and gone damn am i bored it's like okay no judgment so you're bored yeah. that's th because that's when i start going to somebody well what do you, we have basically i think most of our lives are driven by four words what we either want what we need what we think we should do and what we literally are required to do and the required and the should and the need typically wind up taking over our lives. It just does. You know, we have to pay the bills and whatever it may. So when the hamster wheel stops for whatever reason in your life because of disease or a family death or whatever it may be, and all of a sudden you go, I'm bored. Okay, okay. Think, take some time and think about what might unbore you. Because of course, I like to say words that aren't words. What would un what would unbore you? Uh, and you don't have that struggle, and I don't have that struggle. But you and I both know, Kelly, in this on this planet, and in this, we are in the extreme minority. Yes, yes. We're extreme minority, two percent tops. -ish. Really? Yay! Yeah, two percent tops ish in my life. Because all I've heard for the last 10 months is, hey, guys, what have you binged lately? And I'm not against binging. Uh, I'm not against, you know, binge can be a good word. It can also be a negative word. But, yeah. you know, my beautiful thing to people is they're like, bro, what have you binged? I'm like, bro, I don't have time to binge. <laughs> I, got a to -do, I got a to do list that I want to do, that I have cathartic internal energy, cellular joy to do. Yes. And then people just look at me like I'm an insane person. Well, I am sort of, but that's a different subject. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, I'm insane in a healthy way. Um, <laughs> but I mean that. But whatever that is, it doesn't. We tend to judge it, or we do it based on you know our kids or our spouses, or like man, like like even if you just did it for thirty minutes a day, what's a thing you haven't done or a thing you haven't realized that you really truly enjoy that just makes you smile and light because i can be a very intense heavy person and it's like man I, that's why i'm a comic I, I i laugh all the time i sing i turn i'll just take a moment this is what we this again this is part of the covid stuff kelly is that i'll just take 15 minutes in the middle of a really intense day and i'll just stop and play three songs and i'll sing my butt off and then go back to work it's like that's that's stuff we have to do more that's what getting off of this is for. It's like, oh, I just need, you don't have to do it all day. Just 15 minutes. I'm just going to crank up three songs, blow it out. I'm going to get right back to what I'm doing. Because yes. I, just, I just finished this morning. I've been up since 5.45 this morning. I had to spend two hours uh, before trying to actually shower and shave for you and put pants on, uh, which I tend to do even on Zoom because you never know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to type out like four pages, like paragraphs of a, of a legal contract. Like I finished that and my my head hurt. 
my God, ears are bleeding, you know, metaphorically. And so like before I come to sit with you, it's like uh, I go crank up a tune, dance for a second, whatever it is for you. It doesn't matter. Go outside. What I play with your dog. It, yeah. You have to know what that is. Yeah. So that's my thing. I love it. The uh, the uh, phrase that you were using about that cathartic want that in case some people in here are going to hear this later, what he just said is the definition of passion. When you tap into that, because people talk about passion, do you know what that really looks like? Do you know what it feels like? That is what it looks like and feels like. And one other thing before we close out today, because we're just going to have to talk more and, and I'd love to stay around and talk with you uh, when we get there. Um, I've been asked, what is your golf story? So when I hit it way in the wrong direction, you'll wonder where, why the hell anybody would ask that question, but it's cool. I'm good with it. Uh, is you have been really invested and involved in a lot of philanthropic events and where really did that come from? Boy, that's a, that's a solid question. Yes, aside from my organization, which wasn't a non-for-profit, but it didn't make any money. Um, I, did, I, I did become a part of an event that we produced back in the early 90s called Running on Empty, which uh, assisted teen runaway shelters. And then when we had the riots in Los Angeles, I was also part of, I directed a big event at the Masonic Temple here um call together we can together we will and then i also i uh, lost one of my one my first friend in los angeles was a guy i met when i was doing stand-up comedy um and he was a pisces as well our birthdays were a day apart and he died tragically very young of melanoma back before melanoma was an actual subject and i because of he was a golfer and i was a golfer and so i did a 10-year celebrity event uh to raise awareness and money for melanoma and we had Joe Pesci and Michael Chiklis and Patrick Warburton and Dennis Haysbert. I mean, it was a really cool event for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's part of my, as you would say, beautiful dichotomy in the sense that I'm, I'm kind of a hardline, hard nosed guy uh, as a, someone who grew up where he grew up about no BS and do your job and show up and have follow through and, you know, enjoy what you do, but do your job. And then I also am still somebody who is a very sensitive Pisces who, um, you know, understands that I, regardless of how difficult my childhood was, I was born lucky. And, and I'm, at least as I sit here at the moment, I'm healthy. And that's a huge thing. Once you cross like the age of 40, health becomes uh, more prevalent as a, as a priority. And so I guess there's always been a part of me that grew up struggling to get out of where I was. And so I, I, I do look to try and naturally assist those that, that, uh, that perhaps struggle, not to the point of where we would go, you know, being help, always helping somebody who doesn't want to help themselves, but I will always have a helpfulness about me that is just the nature of, of how I grew up and how I got from point A to point B today. Yeah, there's, you can't kill altruism, can you? No. <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. No what happens in life, it's like, which, if you're an altruistic spirit and then you get boundaries, it's like, wow, there's so much freely that, that can happen within that, but you can't kill altruism. No, I, yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, the thing I had to learn was I, you have to learn again, like everything else, to balance out. So, because you don't want to be, you don't want to be a martyr, you don't want to be a victim, and you don't want to be, you know, overtly codependent if you're not wealthy enough to be just purely philanthropic you know you still have to protect your own life and i had to learn that balance i i will tell you right now kelly i was i was not good at that when i was younger that is one of the things one of the biggest things in my life that i that i had to learn was you know kevin you have to take care of yourself too so i i was that that has probably been one of my one of my biggest challenges in life was not to always seek to help others made sure I learned how to take care of myself. That's one of the big bridges I had to cross between my, my late 20s and let's say my early 40s. Okay, yeah, if you don't fill your own cup, you have nothing to share, yeah. for sure. We have uh, dropped your link onto the screen. 
And if you would like to let the folks who will see this know what they're getting, if they would like your free gift. Uh, yeah, it would be it would be a consultation to try and assist somebody with their communication. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's it's intrapersonal communication or whether or not it is professional and, and business related. Uh, communication transcends all of our lives every day, all day long. So at least while we're while we're awake. And so uh, whatever whatever one's challenge would be, uh, whether it is a specific instance in your life with a specific individual or if it's a scenario that involves uh, you know, another form of, of business or professionalism, uh, I will hopefully be able to very quickly clear a bit of that clog for you. That is amazing and very, very generous. I so appreciate that. And I'm sure that that's going to make such a huge difference for a lot of people, which communication being at the core of everything is what we do in one thing we do in everything, right? Yep. And with that, is there anything else that you would like to make sure that the audience knows before we close out? Um, <laughs> somebody recently, this just happened to me the other day and it's ironic because right. like I hadn't <laughs> had been asked this before and I, I found it unique when you get thrown something, you're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. And somebody <laughs> asked me if I could create a meme what would be the picture and what would it say? Uh -huh. And I, I thought it was a pretty terrific question because, of course, I was stumped for a good 15 seconds before I could actually <laughs> come up with what I said. But, yeah. but it's, it still would be, in terms of the hamster wheel, how we started out today, it still would be applicable. And I, I realized in the span of a, of a few seconds that the picture would be the Grand Canyon and the meme would say, do what makes you happy. We aren't here for very long. And thank that's you. what I would say, Kelly. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking to you further. And I appreciate your time today. And uh, with that, you guys have a fantastic Sunday. We'll send the link over. You can see the rest of it. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Kelly. Thank you.